Welcome to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. And I'm bringing another installment of World Championship Wins, a segment in which I feature World Championship Wins. Imagine that. In other words, the decisive games of the World Championships. We're not showing any draws at all. Just the games that were won, whether they were won by the challenger or whether they were won by the champion. Well, this is game three of the first official World Championship match. This game was played on January 15th, 1886. And they were playing Monday, Wednesday, Friday of each week. And this would have been the Friday game. And uh, it was played in New York in Cartier's Hall, Fifth Avenue. And um, this would be the second consecutive victory by Johannes Zuckertort. Steinitz won game one. Well, after the fourth consecutive victory, the match moved to St. Louis, where it resumed on February 3rd. And they played there until Steinitz reached the score of four wins. And that happened in only four games. Uh, three of the four games played in St. Louis were won by Steinitz. One was drawn. And so uh, they made their way next to New Orleans. Um, and after a two-week break between St. Louis and New Orleans, the match resumed there in New Orleans. And uh, that's where it concluded. That's where Steinitz would emerge the first official world champion on March 29th, 1886, with a score of 10 wins five losses and five draws. Now Steinitz himself actually had claimed the world championship title after his uh, victory over Adolf Anderson 20 years earlier, but that was not officially recognized. And so this was set up as an official match the first player to reach 10 victories would be named the world champion. And if they got to 9-9, nine, nine, no one would be named world champion. It would be declared a drawn match. Uh, but uh, in spite of Zuckertort's early lead, Steinitz emerged victorious. And so here we are with game three. And it's going to look somewhat familiar after d4, d5, pawn to c4 with the queen's gambit. Steinitz once again plays the Slav defense with c6. And again, Sukratort with e3. So mimicking the moves of the first game of the match at least the first three moves but here Zuckertort plays an early a3 which of course is definitely not recommended for beginners you want to get your pieces out of bed in uh, game one Zuckertort wisely played knight c3, which is the most common move in the master's database here at chess.com. And um, the game continued with e6, knight f3, developing the second knight, and knight to d7, 
and then a3, preparing for b4. And so that wasn't played here. Here, Sukkotort um, played a3 right away on move four. And of course, you won't see this move ever played again in the master's database. This is the only time. Steinitz played the same triangle formation that he had played in game one. Kind of like an inverted London, isn't it? With this uh, bishop out here on the outside of his pawns. And c5. And so restricting the mobility of the king's bishop and enjoying some space on the queen's side, white again defers the development of his pieces. a5 is played. Not allowing pawn to b4. And so queen to b3 now puts the question to the unprotected b7 pawn. So queen to c7 is played. And then finally a knight gets out of bed. Now we teach you to get your pieces out before your queen, your minor pieces. Let your bishop and your knight lead in the fight. Knight to d7 now. And knight to a4. And here again. Don't move the same piece twice in the opening without a very, 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 very good reason. So again, developing other pieces, particularly your other knight and then your bishops, is to be preferred, especially for beginners. Leave these kinds of moves for world championship level grandmasters like Johannes Steinitz, uh, Johannes Zuckertort, Wilhelm Steinitz, Johannes Zuckertort. Knight G F6 and Knight E2. Now F3 is the um, favorite square of the king's knight. Um, especially when there's no compelling reason not to play to f3, such as is the case here. Uh, in fact, blocking your king's bishop is unnecessary here. But I'm gathering that he intends to use e2 as a pivot square to place his knight on g3 and put the question to the light squared bishop. And bishop e7 develops the final minor piece. And knight to g3, as predicted. Bishop to g6. Bishop to, g, to d2. Black castles. And Black's pieces are looking very good. This is what we like to see from our beginners. So thank you, Mr. Steinitz, for getting your pieces out of bed and getting your king castled safe as a baby and as Betty by snuggled in a blankie, sucking on a binky, here behind the pawn shield. Bishop to e2 and now rook f to b8 lining up with the enemy queen eyeballing the queen over the shoulder of the b man white castles and it's black's desire to open this file and so b6 is played.
Pawn takes pawn is compelled. You can't just leave it there for a black to open with a discovered attack on the queen. So after the knights are traded off, the rook is advanced and the queen is attacked. This is looking pretty good for black. Queen to c3. And that puts heat on the A man, additional heat. It already had the bishop looking there, but now they double attack with the battery. And also eyeballs White's counterpart there on c7. And so there might be some ideas of doubling up on this half-open C file. There might be some ideas of trying to pry that open with an attack on that undefended queen. Well, queen to B7 makes perfect sense. Creating a battery of his own on a half-open file, eyeballing the backward B man. And rook a2 is a fairly sad way to have to defend that b man with nowhere for the rook to go from there except back from whence it came. Now knight d7 prepares to strike at the center. Um, I'm going to retract the arrow pointing to e5. The, all your pieces here are pointing at c5 there's also the idea of getting the queen's rook over to c8 in line with the white queen bishop to d1 um, c5 I'm assuming this is the idea. Yes, bishop a4. And c4. Perhaps um, opening the c file is also an idea. Again, with the rook moving to c8. So I'm not sure why c4 is advantageous, other than his focus is on b2, and this b man's not going anywhere now. That weakness will remain in the position. Queen c1. Knight f6. Uh, bishop to c3. He was just vacating c3, I suppose, to get his bishop there. Well, that gives the bishop... A bit of uh, a case of the tall pawn syndrome, but it does liberate the rook to try to get back into the game. So bishop to d6, pawn to f3, queen to b8. Two attackers, only one defender, threatening to overpower the knight on g3. And so f4 is compelled to obstruct this attack. 
but it creates some weaknesses here in White's camp. Bishop d3, attacking the rook, which flees to e1. And now h5 begins to threaten, although a much more active move is g5, because this will force the position open. You can't pass the pawn, as in some cases. Well, first of all, if you pass the pawn, the bishop just takes the knight. And after the queen captures on g3, black is really in white's face. And this is... Over all of White's pieces are way out of position. So the pawn can't be passed, and for the same reason, the pawn can't be captured, even so you're attacking the knight. Bishop still captures, and then after the recapture, the knight simply posts on e4. Or, if you take the knight, well, there's check. And again, there's an enormous attack coming against the white king. So that can't be played. Um, if you try to defend, well, that doesn't work because the bishop just takes the knight. And you're a goner. White, white's losing this as well. So g5 is a definitely more active move than is h5. But h5 is what was played. Now, I'd still say that black has the better position here. But that uh, g5 would have just been very, de very decisive. H4 inhibits the pawn from coming any further. And then queen to d8 immediately eyes the undefended h-pawn over the shoulder of the knight. Once this knight moves, this pawn is under attack. Bishop d1 super attacking the h-man. And so g6 to defend. And queen d2. That creates a battering ram against the a5 pawn. And so the rook retreats to b8 to create a super defense against the a5 pawn. Queen f2 defends the pawn indirectly, just as it's attacked indirectly. Bishop e7 now adds another attacker. The battery has shifted to another diagonal now. Bishop f3. The problem is, how are you going to clear the D-man out of there? Knight E4. And that D-man 
is going to move perhaps, but only to a much more secure position. And White took with his bishop here. It's better, of course, to take with the knight. Um, this battery is going to be unleashed against h4 either way. And so moving the knight and then vacating g3 for the g-man to interpose between the bishop and the queen. And then you have a still your bishop, which has more mobility than the knight. Although in closed positions, knights are usually preferred. The problem is this knight has nowhere to go. Every square to which it can go is hot. And so you might as well unload it for the counterpart on e4. So after knight takes e4, he takes e4, bishop d1, then bishop h4, g3. And when the bishop retreats, well, black still has an advantage here. But uh, white has a more mobile minor piece than in the actual continuation that was played. Which was bishop takes e4, pawn takes e4, knight to h1, bishop takes, and pawn to g3. This poor knight in the corner with no square to go to. Totally useless. So you can compare the two positions. Let me put it up again. This is the position compared to if the knight takes. And of course, this bishop could also have gone back to e7 as it did in the game. So here you have this bishop compared to, in the other position, a knight that can't go anywhere. It's like the Veggie Tales, the pirate that don't do anything. He just stays home and lies around. And if you ask him to do anything, he will tell you, I don't do anything. Well, he can't do anything. <laughs> All right. Well, Queen D2 evacuates a square for the knight. Reestablishes the eyeball on A5. Queen D5. There's the knight F2. A4. I don't know that he really needs to worry about this pawn. It still might be desirable to be looking for some pawn breaks either on g5 or h4. Especially with this queen now centralized and uh, able to swing over to the king's side of the board fairly easily. The bishop on e7 able to swing in. Probably g5, again, would be a move here. a4, king g2, rook b3. Rook B3. Well, it, def it stops the pawn from moving. What else does it do? I'm not real clear completely on the purpose of Rook B3.
Rook H1. King G7. Is he planning on swinging his rook over as well? Rook A, A1. Bishop D8. Now, now we're starting to understand the point of Rook B3. So his idea is to bring this bishop, and that was the idea of A4 as well. So you look at these last few moves by black. So a4 is in preparation of this bishop relocation. Rook b3 is in preparation of that move. And then bishop d8 signals black's intention to interrogate these two pieces from a5. So g4 obviously wants to open the h file and wants to lock the bishop in place on the d8 h4 diagonal black does not want to open the file for this rook so the move necessary here is h4 but um, steinitz blundered and captured the pawn on g4. Look at the difference. If you play h4, and by the way, this was move 38, so they're coming right to the end of the time control. And we saw that on a previous game between these two, that, yes, game two it was move 37 when Steinitz blundered with king h2 instead of king g2, if you remember the last game. And that was move 37. This is move 38. Steinitz undoubtedly in time trouble again. Plays h takes g4. If he plays h4, This bishop holds the position and blocks out the rook and just keeps everything at bay. G5 cannot be played as some sort of obstruction move because of the exposure of the king on G2 and the pawn on G5. They share a file Therefore, the bishop can simply sacrifice itself on g5. Really, it wouldn't be a sacrifice because white would not dare capture because he's being mated in two if he does. Check. Mate. And so perhaps a black was so short on time he was concerned about h5 he was concerned about um, playing h4 because he was concerned that the bishop's defense could be cut off and interfered with and then white's winning the pawn in the open file anyway But he so and he didn't have time to see that the pawn would was would actually be capturable. 
That's the only thing that makes sense. And so in his mind, I'm gathering. He thought, well, I'm going to lose that pawn anyway, so I might as well get something out of it. I'm going to lose that pawn and have his rook on an open file anyway. Must have been what he was thinking on move 38 when he didn't have a whole lot of time to calculate. Well, another negative feature of pawn takes pawn on g4 is that the knight recaptures and now the knight is in the vicinity of the black king. Well, on move 39, a more egregious blunder. I don't know if it's more egregious, but it's at least as. Black hurriedly continues with his original plan. And on move 40, making the time control, Sukertort finds a beautiful little tactic. Rook to h7 check. Notice the rook cannot be captured. Notice the peace relationship between the rook on h7 and the queen on d5. If the king captures, as you can see, the fork can be played. Bye-bye, queen. And so, king to f8 is played. Now, really, white is in control no matter what is played here. White's winning now. He went from losing to winning. But on principle of points... You are, you are giving um, eight points in exchange for nine. And you still have two rooks and two bishops against a rook, a queen, and a bishop. Should still be an easy enough win well, yeah, never mind, because this is going to be overpowered. You got this battery against bishop on a5, and only one defender, so never mind. You just capture that, and white's winning. So there's no... At this point, after rook h7, I'm sure black's already realizing he's going to lose this game, and he doesn't resign yet but the time control is made rook h8 check one quick repetition to make the time control and then queen f2 is going to bring the queen into the party the queen's rook into the party this game is soon going to be over He holds on for another several moves, trying to reverse uh, the blunder. He plays bishop to d8, knight e5, super attacking the pawn, king g8, rook a h1, defending, Bishop f6. Stopping rook h8. But not stopping rook takes f7. Rook f8 says, All right, let's trade rooks. And you'll 
get an extra pawn, but I'll still have some fight. Uh, not so. Rook takes bishop instead, saying, you know what I'll do? Since you were so nice to give me the open file and the initiative, I'll let you have my rook for your bishop. Well, black resigned here. Um, the reason is pretty obvious because after the capture, you have this fork. And there's no defense. If you try to save your rook with a move like queen d8, well, you just get checkmated immediately. Checkmate. And on the other hand, if you try to run away, well, where are you going to go? That's still checkmate. King f8. Check after queen takes rook. Followed by checkmate. There's nowhere to, to, to go. It's just going to be checkmate. You can throw in a couple of spite checks. Um, after queen h4, you can spite check with the rook. Then you can spite check with the bishop. And then you can spite check with the other rook. <laughs> but now you're out of spite checks. And mate is coming on the next turn. So the only way to even prolong it is to stop uh, queen to f7, but then you still have queen f6 threatening checkmate. So you have to play something like so. But then you have check. And after king f8, um, rook h8 check forces the queen away from the defense of the magic square. Bada bing, bada boom, checkmate. In this game, Sucker Tort had an accuracy of 93.23. Finding the best move 51.1% of the time. And Steinitz had an accuracy of 87.95, finding the best move 50% of the time. Steinitz was in control of the game and was apparently winning until that key move, that unfortunate blunder. And this is the second game where we can put our finger on a very specific blunder that turned the tide completely. This was the position. The move that keeps black in control is h4. g5 is not playable. because of the ability to just take that pawn free for nothing. White does not dare capture or he's made it in two. So therefore pushing the pawn is not possible. White can continue the game with other moves. Maybe try to double his rook still. But Playing g5 just gives the pawn away free for nothing. So this was the critical point in the game. 
It was move number 38. The clock was ticking. Time was soon to expire. And Steinitz pulled a coach Daniel once again for the second consecutive game and choked under time pressure and threw away a winning position. You've seen it happen several times this past Monday in the Arena Kings uh, qualifying tournament. <laughs> oh, what a shame. So good game. I hope you enjoyed it. And tune in next time for game four. Until then, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.